I make it about seven o'clock, and um, there's a, a lot of people here, so we'll try and move. Um, a couple of things I want to do. First of all, if I may, but um, let's do the um, let's do apologies for absence first. I've had um, Tom Anderson and David Armstrong, who is on leave. Are there any other? Phil, Phil Brightmore, Good morning, Shanton. Oh, sorry, uh, Kate Cannon, Phil Brightmore, and Jeffrey Watson. Okay, and Jeffrey's on our barrel. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, just before we get into members' code of conduct and declaration of interest, I just wanted to um, seek the committee's approval to adjust the agenda. There's a, there's a couple of things. Um, and, and first of all, you know, apologies, because we, we don't have a constituency manager as such, and so a lot of people have been making new amending and, and trying to help out, uh, which isn't great. And I'm sure when I speak to Matthew a bit later on, he will tell us how he's going to resolve that situation. So I think the uh, committee and the residents of, of Rural West deserve that. But thanks everyone for, for stepping in. Um, I asked when we were putting this agenda together that we should have uh, an, issue, an item on the local plan uh, because I know that's been a real issue of concern to residents that have contacted me and I know that have contacted other colleagues as well. So what I've been intending to do, I would have raised it as an AOB. So I'm intending to have that as an item of any other business. But I'm also uh, understand that the urgent care centre development, the lady who's coming to give us a presentation on that, which again I think will be of interest to everybody, is she sent me a note to say that she's been double booked and so can we put her on a little bit later. So what I intend to do is to replace urgent care on the agenda, urgent care, with a discussion about the local plan and we've got David here who's been going around doing the uh, public meetings. So I think a bit of an update on those public meetings would be useful and also give people an opportunity to uh, to talk to the constituency committee about their feelings on those public meetings and the issue itself. Uh, so we'll do that and we'll uh, uh, then we'll try and see how we go. We want to have that road safety update because that's something we asked for and we've got our colleagues here for that and then again of course community question time and I'm sure we hope to be finished by about nine o'clock. Hopefully, um, people won't be too upset if we have to squeeze some of the agenda areas to make sure that we get in that uh, that update on the local plan. So that's my intention. On that basis, I will declare a personal interest if we're going to discuss the local plan, because I'm a non-exec director on Magenta. I've had it clarified that this isn't a decision-making body and we're in listing mode. So, um, so I, I believe a personal, by stating a personal interest, making that absolutely clear. I think there is a, it, is my gender a developer or not? I'm, as far as I'm concerned, it's a personal interest, but I'll facilitate the discussion. Um, in, and uh, does anybody else have any other interest to declare? I believe, yeah. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to declare a personal interest in the um, constituency committee's um, spend because I'm chairing the Greasby Community Association, which benefits from some of the grants in the past. Okay, and uh, can we? The, there will be those interest because we're putting that out again for people to apply. So again, I'm, I'm sure any of us who are on management committees and so on and so forth would want a, a blanket interest to be applied in those circumstances. Is, is that okay? Okay, lovely. So let's uh, let's crack on, if I may. Oh, a couple of things I wanted. First of all, to, to welcome Mike, Mike Sullivan, uh, to the meeting. You're very welcome, Mike. I know you're flying under a different flag today, so you're, uh, you're very welcome. And also, uh, just to just to agree that we should all switch our phones off, and thanks for, uh, or at least put them on silent. 
Um, mine's very loud, so I need to find one which is stuck down here. Um, just, just to be clear, that wasn't my name. But um, oh, I'd already put it on silent, so that's okay. Um, so yeah, and, and I think today is going to be potentially Matthew Patrick's last uh, meeting. Um, I, I'd just like to put on record, he is the Vice Chair of the Committee, but I would like to place on record my personal thanks to Matthew for his support of this constituency committee. He's been a, a very active um, and eloquent voice for the area that he represents, but beyond that as well, he's always had the interests of rural west in terms of the discussions that we've always had. So, um, he's been a, an outstanding politician, if you don't mind me saying so. He's always been keen to make sure people's voices are heard. So, it will be a loss to the council, but thank you for your service to this committee particularly. So, thank you for that. Uh, okay, we move on then to the minutes, if we may. Are the people content that they're accurate? Yeah. All we're checking, we're not saying we agree with them all. Yes. We're just saying, are they accurate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, can we agree those then? Yeah. This is always quite obvious where I have to sign them, because I'm sure no one pays up the line where they're going to us to do that. But that's been signed, so thank you very much for that. Um, moving right along, we've got the Wirral West constituency report. Would you like to take us through? Well, it's more of a budget report because we don't have a constituency manager, isn't it? So, if you, yes. if you wouldn't mind, that would be great. So, I'll take the committee through the recommendations for the expenditure for the constituency committee for the year 1819. So, members will be aware that this year the £50,000 core budget allocated to each committee has been reinstated. Right. So, it is proposed that that is spended in the way that is established for this committee. So utilising a grants programme which residents and uh, members of this committee are able to show their support for grants funded programmes operating in, across the constituency. So running the small grants programme and the schedule for that is all outlined in the report. Um, the second decision for the committee is um, a proposal to spend £25,000 allocated for environmental projects. And there are three proposals to utilise this funding, which is comprised of £12,500 for last year's expenditure and a further £12,500 for this year. Um, it is proposed that that is spent as follows. So £5,000 to fund five environmental action days in each ward across the constituency. £15,000 to again run the Small Grant Big Difference Fund, which has again was rolled out last year and the remaining 5,000 to be spent on local improvements in ward areas. Uh, finally, the contents of the report include any underspends that were um, amassed during last financial year, and those are committed and included within the report. Open for questions. Okay, I, I think the first thing that's amassed might be a quite overstated case of the question, <coughs> uh, but in terms of any underspends, I think, and again, one of the great things, when, and because we don't have the constituency manager, so we don't have Jane here today. But I think one of the things I've always been keen on is evaluating what we've actually spent the money on previously. And for those people that do have PACs, you'll see uh, the work that's been done in um, uh, Greasby, Frankly, Irby, Hoylake and Mells, um, and again, some of the schemes with some of the things that have been done, Hoylake and Mells in Bloom, obviously. Pensby and Thingwall in terms of some of the grants there to Pensby Library Volunteers, Irby Thurston, Thurston Pensby Amenity Society, Pensby Recreation Centre, Thingwall Recreation Centre. And you will see what's been given and uh, the success and the impact of those grants. And I think the entire committee actually, we do this differently to some places. Um, certainly we do it differently to Birkenhead, I think, don't we? Um, Whereas, you know, um, we think some relatively small sums of money can make a really big difference and can actually uh, start, help start uh, some, some new initiatives and new schemes that actually do make a huge difference to the local community. And I, you know, going back a while, I think, I seem to remember, and Jerry will help me with this. Um, there's Jerry. 
in terms of one of our the first things we did when we, um, was the uh, festival of first. You'll remember that, won't you? But um, it, it well, exactly. That was the point. It came here. It was quite small to start, but it's grown and it's become a really major part of uh, of Wirral West, Hoylake, uh, West Kirby, etc., Mells, and what have you. So there are some initiatives that we can give Seacorn money to that actually develop and, and, and work incredibly well. So, so this approach, I think, has, uh, has shown that it's got merit. The other big thing for us has always been trying to make sure we have a, a, a residence uh, vote on those schemes as well. And we always like to make sure that those people that are putting forward their ideas come to an event where uh, residents can discuss and they can pitch those their ideas to residents and also one of the really beneficial things we found is that uh, those connections can get made as well so between those groups that are pulling forward so it also helps that um, let's call it civic society that we're all keen to engender so so i think the approach that you've outlined there seems uh, a good one is that supported by the committee is that agreed? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Committee Zeller. So those recommendations are endorsed. On the bright side, and where's David? There you are. Oh, David, you've been set out on your own almost. Um, uh, that brings us to my item AOB, which was the local plan. And a lot's been going on around the local plan. You've had two meetings in Rural West. Um, I know you've had other meetings elsewhere. I can make the, the ones at the concourse, but I didn't get to see the presentation um, that you made at the town hall. So I've seen the presentation. I'm sure other colleagues have seen those presentations too. Uh, but a lot's been going on. So what I'd look like, if, if the committee is content, because uh, as we know, it's not a public meeting, it's a meeting held in public. The way I'd like to cover this one, if that's OK, would be for David to give us an update and then sort of throw it over to colleague people, that, <coughs> residents that have turned up today to ask their questions, make their points, and then we'll see, uh, we'll see, I'm sure off the back of that one or two people want to say a few things too. So broadly speaking, that's the way we're going to try and uh, cover it. Does that broadly meet people's expectations of why they come here this evening? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Let's try and do that, and then what we'll do, maybe if someone can capture some of the points we made, yeah, that's great, and then perhaps towards the end we can try and get David to answer a few, maybe sum up and answer a few of the questions and the points that have been made. Is that okay? The one thing I would ask as we do this, because I know how passionate people have become around this, is to, is to remember that David is an officer of the authority and is doing what he has been instructed to do. So it's not a personal crusade on behalf of David to develop this local plan and to upset everyone. I think what he has to do is to do to his best professional skill and ability what he has been asked to do. So I'd like everybody, if that's okay, to try and keep this as civil and uh, um, uh, curious, because it's curiosity that's brought people here, as possible, as opposed to, you know, yelling, screaming and finger pointing, if that's it. Because we can do that at the town hall as well as anybody else. So, uh, hopefully you'll be better behaved than the people are at the town hall. So, with that, David, would you like to give us a bit of an update? Okay. Can anybody hear me at the back okay? Yeah. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Um, back on the 23rd of July of this year, the Cabinet of the Council considered a report on the local plan in Wirral, um, which was a development options review. What that report looked at is the um, local plan in terms of land supply for the future, for employment uses, housing uses and mixed uses and also identified other potential options around open spaces, densities and the duty to cooperate with other local councils. Uh, the Cabinet took a decision that we should formally consult on those development options 
and that formal consultation commenced on the 3rd of September. Um, I have done 15 consultation events across Wirral in the last uh, three or four weeks and you may have seen uh, some of those presentations. There's approximately 1,500 people who attended those events and they were briefing events to um, really give you information on what uh, we were consulting on. Uh, the formal consultation period ends on the 26th of October and we need written representations in on the consultation by that date. They need to be written because they will form part of an evidence base that eventually will be put before the planning inspector when the local plan is formally uh, examined. Um, we're encouraging everybody to have their say because the consultation is really important uh, for the future of Wirral. Our local plan will stretch over the next 15 years, so we'll run by the time it's adopted from somewhere around 2020 20, 21 uh, through to about 2035. Uh, um, when we started the consultation, we were working on the um, currently published um, Office of National Statistics information on new household projections. Uh, you may be aware that a week or so ago now, uh, new projections came out from the ONS. Uh, they gave lower numbers than the ones that we uh, were aware of uh, before. Um, we've now heard from the government that uh, they will be responding to those new household figures by way of a consultation exercise starting on the 3rd of December. Um, the government over the next few years have a housing target of 300,000 uh, units, dwellings to be built across the country. Uh, when you add up all the figures in the recently published ONS uh, information, they come to about 214,000. So clearly, as you can see, there's a gap there between the government target and the ONS figures. So governments are going to be consulting on how they look at those numbers, how they use them. It's not just about population, it's about household formation, affordability and other things in there. And the likelihood is that they'll try and get the numbers nationally up to the 300,000 target. But until we see the consultation, we're not aware of the full extent of it. Um, but that is likely um, to be the approach. Um, our formal consultation will be reported back to the Cabinet um, of the Council on the 17th of December um, of this year. And then once that consultation has been reported back, the members will make some decisions on the development options because they've got a range of choices uh, in front of them. Uh, when they've done that, then the uh, local plan will be modified. It will be out again for further consultation. It will then uh, be reported to a full council meeting in July 2019. And then if that plan is approved at that meeting, uh, there will be a formal submission of the plan to the Secretary of State in September 2019. And then following that, there will be an examination of that plan by um, a government import appointed uh, planning inspector. We then go through that process. Um, if that plan then is accepted, it comes back to the council for formal adoption, and then it becomes our new local plan. So that's the position as it stands today, Councillor Green. Okay, thank you for that, uh, David. What I'd like to do now, if that's okay, is uh, to hand this you know, questions and observations over to, to residents and the people that are here this evening. Can I, and if you want to make a point, can I ask that you raise your hand? Um, I'll try and call you. We'll see how we go, because we'll try and, uh, if necessary, try and group them. Um, there are some one or two old hands here that I've seen once or twice, and I've seen one hand go up already. So I'm going to try and ask uh, newish people, but you'll, you'll get to go, don't you worry. So the lady at the front, if that's okay. Thank you. My name's Jane Chesters. Um, in view of these new figures that you say you have now at your fingertips, <coughs> these are the ones for the National Statistics Office. And uh, thank you very much. The two lots of figures that you now have at your disposal, 
does this still involve the green belt? I mean, this is what we all want to know. And are you going to string everybody out for two more years before you make a decision on what green belt you're going to use? You know, there's more than just planning offices and goodness knows what in this. There's a lot of personal people who are employed within farms, within industries, their life is on hold. And don't you think, in all fairness, you should decide now. You have the figures at your disposal. You had a planning permission with Willow Waters on Monday. And you have said yes to their planning, which goes a long way to alleviate the situation with the houses. Surely you don't have to string us out for two more years. Thank you. Yeah. I, I noticed you were looking directly at me when you were asking those questions. Um, I, I would I just point this out. Um, unfortunately, some would say, not many, but some would say that it, it's not a matter for me uh, to decide uh, because we don't control the council. But what we can do is make our arguments in council. With, resp with respect to the specific point about the new figures and what a game changer they are. Can I, uh, can I pass that across to, to David to, to respond to directly? Yeah, okay, thank you, Councillor Green. Um, yeah, in terms of the current figures, these are the new ones that were published a week or so ago now by the ONS. They give figures for Wirral. At the moment, on the information we had, it was 803 new dwellings a year. On the new figures, it looks as though the number is going to be around 488 per year. Okay, so that's a significant drop from the figures that that we had previously. Um, now, in terms of those figures, what we've asked the government is how are they going to use them? Because those figures are what are called household projections. Now, to work out the housing need, you need more than household projections. There's other things that go into the calculation. Uh, household formation is one of those. Affordability calculations, um, and they take account of uh, population trends and, and other factors as well. So we're waiting to see how the government is going to respond to those figures and, and what it says about them. So when I mentioned that they're going to consult on this on the 3rd of December, that's the date when we'll actually find out what they're proposing to consult on and how they're proposing to, um, uh, to manage this. Now what they have said is that their national target is 300,000 over the next few years and at the moment on the new figures we're at 214,000. So as I say, what I think will happen is they'll be looking at those figures I'm looking to move the figures up to get to their national uh, target, <coughs> which is what they've already indicated they'll be looking to do. So I, I appreciate that this is a really difficult time for everybody and there's a whole range of issues, but we're going to have to wait until early December when we see the consultation to understand what the government is going to do with these particular figures. Once we know that, uh, we will then be able to get to a position, hopefully, where we have a number um, for Wirral that we'll then put into the local plan and we'll be able to assess the, the implications of that in terms of the requirement um, to go into the green belt. Now, what we're doing at the moment is we're maximising to the greatest extent that we can all of the existing urban sites, those urban sites which are currently used for employment but there's no future need for them, so if you look at places like um, some of the vacant land at Burton's in Morton, there's 299 houses that will go on there in the very near future. That's one example of where we've tried to use uh, employment land that's no longer needed. We're looking at increasing densities, so building more on the land that we have available. The issue with Willow Waters um, is that they've given us a range of numbers. Um, I've said at the public consultation meetings that ideally I would like to include the largest possible number from Peel because clearly the more you build in World Waters, the less you have to build in the Green Belt. 
Now, not all of the development in rural waters will help our housing needs because it will all be primarily high density apartments, so it won't be family housing. It's unlikely to be affordable housing um, because of the viability issues and other things. But what we're waiting for Peel to do is to submit to us, which they promised to do, their analysis of how they justify their numbers. That's really important because what I will then do is put them before an independent planning inspector. I'll say that's the evidence that we've got. Will that stand up when we come into the examination stage? And if they say yes, then we will put the current number, which is just about 1,100 that we've put in for Will Waters, and we'll increase it to whatever level can be justified. So we're doing all of those things to try and get into a position uh, where we minimise the take in the green belt. Even with these revised figures, if we assume for a moment it's around 488 per annum, you would still require to go into the green belt, but not um, obviously to the same extent as you would under the 803 number. I apologise if that's a very long answer to the question, but I just tried to explain. Can, can I, can I, can I in, in a second? Can I ask your patients on that? What about the sites that we developing? At the meeting of the Greens Community Centre, there was a lady there who spoke. There was a lady who spoke most eloquently. She helped with homeless people in Birkenhead itself. And she said that the actual estates there do need, they need looking at. Most of the property needs uh, rebuilding, it needs updating. <coughs> Communities don't want to be split. She said that the houses that you're going to build on Green Belt will, will be unaffordable to them. And Whittle Waters did say that 20% of their dwellings will be at the optimum rate so people can afford them. You know, I mean, it, it, I, I appreciate you've got a lot of figures to give out and that, but it's not giving us answers. You know, if you look at what you've got to be redeveloped, all we're doing is making slums of brown, existing brown belt that's poorly built on, and you're going on to new pastures. That is unacceptable. Thank you. Councillor colleagues, you want to get in on this, um, but I did say it was going to be over to the uh, yeah. to the people who were tended. Uh, first, but I'll, I'll, and, and can I also point out, it, it is very difficult for David because, and I know this is you know, one of the things I really dislike the most when I hear it, but David is having to follow a process, so he must show that that process is auditable and compliant, etc. I don't, because I'm a, I'm a, a, a local councillor and share everyone else's concern as I know what he does around the encroachment into Greenbelt. But I will hazard a guess and make an assumption, and I think this is a reasonable assumption, that as long as people stay organised and stay active in terms of the campaign that's been waged about maintaining the Greenbelt, I think it would be bizarre, bizarre, for when this report comes back that David has had to produce on the rules that have been identified, that if people then did not take account of those new numbers that have been introduced and also the, the greater clarity around what people want to do at, uh, uh, at Wirral Water. So, uh, you know, it's no, there's no firm response and David can't give you a firm response because he has to follow the process. But I, I would just say it would be bizarre beyond imagination that if those new figures weren't actually factored in. I'm going to let Phil have a go, and then there's the gentleman in the green. I don't think I need that. Thanks for that, Chair. David, you're just spinning the uh, council rhetoric. We, we, we hear, hear everything that you're saying all the time. It's uh, a load of nonsense, to be quite honest, a lot of what you say. You said about the figure of 488, that figure is actually 477. So, and then you're turning around saying uh, about the 214,000 compared to the government's 300,000. 
what you're actually doing is you're scaring the life out of the people, the residents of Whittle, by telling them these figures, and then they're going to be pushed up, possibly to the 300,000 mark. That 300,000, by the way, covers all the country, not, it's not, no, not just Whittle. Whittle does not need any building on Greenbelt whatsoever. Just let me pull something up there, David. There was a, a series of consultation meetings starting on the 3rd of September. And by the way, we're still within that consultation period because of what you said about the letters going in. Those, I think there's not anybody on this, in this room here who wouldn't turn around and say that those consultations were flawed, very flawed. Given the fact that uh, the Office of National Statistics, were, were gonna, and you knew, your council knew and you knew that these figures were going to come out while that consultation was going on. And you had a good idea that those figures were going to be lower than the ones that you, you've been projecting. And I would say that we need, and I, I think most people would agree, that those consultations should be scrapped now, started again, and this time without rushing them through. Um, we talk about figures there before, Chairman, about the, um, the campaigns. Our campaign figure, and it's rising daily, we are up to nearly 22,000 signatures. That means 22,000 residents disagree with the Labour Council group, they disagree with the planning. They, and I'll be quite honest, most people think you're corrupt. You're corrupt as hell. Yeah. 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 But it's true. No, 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 it's, it is certainly not true. Well, I can prove, I can no, point, hang on, point hang on. it that way, which I will do. No, no, hang on, just hang on, hang on, hang on. We want a public inquiry into what is going on with Whittleford Council, and I think everyone in this room would agree to that. No, well, we hang on. want a public no. Thanks, sir. Let me, let me just um, say a couple of things. First of all, I do not believe that any of the uh, council officers and, uh, and the uh, ruling Labour administration are uh, corrupt in that, in that sense. And, and I will also, uh, also, you know, I'll, I don't know how to tell you this, David, but I'll go to my grave knowing that you as an individual are as straight as there possibly could be looking at this. So, so, please, so please, please, I did ask, and Mike, behave yourself. Can I just, can I just make it? Phil, stop it. I made the point at the very outset that I want this to be a measured discussion. There's some young people at the back. I think those young people need to hear and would like to hear people ask questions and get a response. What we don't want is trading of insults. This could get very high emotionally very quickly. Let's try and keep it at a level where we're asking questions and we're getting responses. Let's see if we can all behave better than we behave in council. So, uh, there was the gentleman in, in the green top the first, and then there's a gentleman in the red shirt under the clock, uh, but without uh, anything in his look off. <laughs> yes, sir. well, just a, a basic first point, which really was not on my agenda. Um, the Office for National Statistics altered the figures drastically for the world. There are 86 local authorities in England, as far as I'm aware. And I don't know any more than that. Well, maybe there's maybe 186. Okay. What's, what's for our figures between friends? Exactly. <laughs> the governments are still requesting the same 300,000. Well, it's, sorry, it's not very logical, is it? If, if they reduce the contribution they ask from all different local authorities, surely they've got to own, uh, alter their own sort of net figure. So, uh, is, that, is it just me or, and my sort of uh, grasp of maths? 
I'm sure it must be logical to everybody. I agree. Yeah. I think yeah. the, yeah. Is, that, is that the question? Yeah, well, you're, you're the politicians, why don't you point it out to well, central government? Is, is that your question? It's a question, yes. All right, OK. Can I come in here? Well, no, because what I've said is we're going to ask yeah. the residents to ask the various questions. Not and because. we will... It's not on my agenda. Yeah. That's okay. just an obvious um, question. Yeah. OK. Yeah, so, to answer that Mike, question. no. You've already started between you and Phil. No. It's the gentleman under the clock. I do have other questions. I don't need that. That's okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. My name's Pete Owen. Um, I'd like to ask a question about or put this whole thing in the context of who's responsible for what. And my understanding is that the government comes out by the Office of National Statistics with a number for the whole country. Somehow that number is then prorated to give the number for the Wirral or any other area, any one of the 186. And Wirral Council in this instance responds to that number with its understanding of what the requirement is on the Wirral. It seems to me <coughs> that we're losing sight of the fact here that the responsibility for determining how many houses required on the world is part of the local plan and that's the responsibility of the council and Mr. Walker. Okay, thank you. I think that's uh, it's, David, is that uh, that sounds to be pretty accurate to me. And if you want to help I'll I'll try and um, um, respond to that uh Councillor Bree. Um, yeah in terms of the Office of National Statistics, that gives you the information on the household projections, the numbers that you need each year. There are other factors that go into calculating housing need uh, and numbers, um, which I tried to cover a few minutes ago. Uh, the other thing is that in those numbers, which are minimum numbers, there is no um, percentages in there for economic growth. And obviously economic growth is important because the more you grow your economy, the more you need in terms of jobs, employment and housing as well. So there are other factors to put into there. So as we come into the local plan process, it will be for the council ultimately to decide based on its needs, uh, what it may wish to consider for growth for the future and the other factors. We have to come out with a number and then we have to be able to justify that number and robustly defend it at an examination in public. Now, what we're doing in terms of that piece of work at the moment, we've engaged the University of Liverpool um, to work with us to actually go through all of the statistics and to go through all of these other variations to come out with a number that we feel is robust and that we can defend through the local plan process. So that's what we have to do through the local plan. But the government perspective is that they will have a view on these ONS numbers, and as mentioned already, they have a, a national target over the next few years and they will probably be looking to keep that national target at that level from the indications that we have um, from that. And hence this consultation on the 3rd of December when it comes out, we will see what implication that has on the ONS numbers and the other factors they want us to take into place. Then we'll have to work that through the local plan process and where it will all come together um, is in the full council meeting next July when we will have our full plan and we'll have to have all our numbers and everything in that document for the council to consider approving before we move on to the next stage. Yeah, and, and can I just... Well, it's, it's, as, it's as good as we're going to get tonight, but we'll see if it develops. Well, can I, I just make a point? It's not the answer. This is a ready fire aim strategy. They've seen an opportunity, for whatever that they may see the opportunity as, to build more and more houses together, more council tax in, or whatever, and they've gone off on that. What we should be doing is getting on the front foot, producing a local plan which we understand because of, we live here as a group, you represent us, you represent a small area, but you guys and the rest of the, the council, and David, who takes instruction, we need to come up with a local plan and take it to the government. Show it to them. I, 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 and the only thing I can say is I completely agree with you. And to go back to the gentleman in the green 
uh, sure to point to your point as opposed to another question because we've got others asking. Uh, it would be, it, no, no, it would be, it would, no, okay, there's a lot of other, you've had a go, there are lots of other people who want to ask questions. Uh, that the, it would be bizarre for, if we come up with a local need based on ONS, for the government to insist you build more houses than you need, that would just be daft. Right, we're going back out to the audience. The lady in the pink top has been trying to get in for a while, then I'll go to the gentleman at the back and then there's a gentleman just here. Hi, um, I do appreciate that obviously we've got a growing population, we've got a change in housing needs and, and all of that kind of stuff, so we do, we do need, as a nation, as a nation, as a nation, don't shout at me, um, as a nation we have got a growing population, we are an island and therefore you know we've got a finite amount of space but my concern is that as a council we're kind of looking at things here and here and here and we haven't got a joined up plan you know in Birkenhead and in New Ferry and in Rock Ferry there's lots of space there's lots of opportunity and there's a massive massive amount of need um, in Hamilton Square as an example I cannot think of another city or another town in the United Kingdom that would misuse a space like that. You know, that should be full of families. It should be full of, of people spending money in that, in that local area. It is spitting distance from Liverpool. It, it is totally, totally misused. And I think that that's a real, real shame. You know, you can get a whole property in Hamilton Square for around 250 grand in Edinburgh, a comparative property is around 750. In London, it's around 20 million. They have the similar thing in Bristol, similar thing in Bath, and people cannot buy those properties quick enough. In Birkenhead, we are the only example where that isn't the case. And um, the council agreed to a heritage plan for Hamilton Square over a year ago. That hasn't been actioned, so nothing is happening there which could help solve this problem. And that would save two communities. It would stop us feeling sad that our green belt is being built on. It would stop people in Birkenhead kind of being on the bones of their arses because no one shops there, no one goes there, no one wants to be there. And I just think it's a real shame that we're not thinking collectively because that's the bigger picture. We're not this side and that side of the motorway. We're a tiny peninsula, and I don't understand why we're not thinking Collectively, it just, I just can't make sense of it. Okay. So, can I, see, so can I, you know, some people start out and shout, shouting and finish off by clapping. So, can I ask that all the speakers are given the right to, uh, the views and we hear them to the end. I am fine to defend myself. No, no, I know you are. I know you are, but... Right. Uh, the gentleman at the back, uh, in the tie. Thank you. Uh, I thought I was the young one at the back. Uh, uh, David, thank you for all the work you've done over the last weeks and things. But I, I'd just like the people here today to uh, be party to a letter I wrote to Phil Davis. I'll just point out a few paragraphs. Reference this is referring to Phil, your comments in the Northwest Place, reported by Jessica Middleton Pugh. You now state you have revised your thinking regarding the local plan for the period of 2020 to 2035. You now agree a figure of less than 500 homes. The figure is somewhere between 470 and 480. May be required as opposed to your previously stated figure of a minimum of 800 per annum. A huge difference which alters the whole perspective and argument for building on Greenbelt. The fact that we arrived at this point was the lack of the local plan. If this had been done properly, we wouldn't have had government intervention. We now have government intervention.